Today marks the start of the third month of Ukraine's counteroffensive. Counteroffensive, which began on the 4th of June, which had been widely discussed and promoted in the media in the West for months beforehand, which had been discussed on Russian and Ukrainian telegram channels, stretching all the way back to the autumn of last year, and of which I suspect early plans were probably drawn up last summer, summer of 2022. Anyway, this offensive, which was supposed to break through to the Sea of Azov, reaching uh, Mariupol and Mel Melitopol, and then breaking through from Melitopol to the Sea of Azov. Of course, Mariupol is on the Sea of Azov. This offensive is stuck, and it appears to be stuck in all the places where it is taking place in the Zaporozhye front, in the push towards Tokmak and Melitopol, and from Melitopol on to the Sea of Azov, in the Vremevka ledge area, pushing on towards Mariupol, also, as I said, on the Sea of Azov. And on that topic, by the way, um, I've now read that the Ukrainian soldier who said that there are 12 villages between Staromayorsk and uh, Mariupol uh, was wrong. In fact, it turns out that on that same road, there are not 12 villages, there are actually 15. So, just to say, but of course that's really a little academic, since for the moment Ukraine still seems to be stuck at uh, Staromayorsk and hasn't yet reached the major Russian fortified lines on the way to Mariupol. Anyway, they're stuck in that area as well. And they're also stuck on the front line in Bakhmut. Now, there was some rather confusing information about the fighting in and around Bakhmut yesterday. There was a report that I read yesterday which suggested that Kleshevka this hotly contested village is in the grey zone, which is to say that neither the Ukrainians nor the Russians have troops in it, though the, it did go on to say that the Russians dominate the area around Kleshevka because they are uh, in, in control of all the high ground, and that makes it impossible for Ukrainian troops to enter and establish themselves in the village. However, simultaneously, I, I read other reports which continue to insist that Kleshevka is fully under Russian control. And as I discussed in my previous video, there were also reports that the Russians have actually pushed the Ukrainians back in the Kleshevka area. And in fact, there's been another claim to that effect, or at least claims that the Ukrainians are being pushed back in the Bakhmut area, and this time it's coming from the Russian news agency, the official Russian news agency, TASS. And um, it's again been provided by Jan Gagin, Jan Gagin, military analyst and advisor to the acting head of the Donetsk People's Republic, Denis Pushilin. I should stress, obviously, this is these are Russian officials, and... Um, he um, went on, the, the, the TASS report goes on to say that the, quote, Gagin is saying the initiative near Artyomovsk, that's to say the former Bakhmut, is in our hands. We hit the Ukrainian forces hard. They are retreating. And I suspect that it is these reports that are the more accurate, that uh, the reports that the Ukrainians are advancing in the Bakhmut area are almost certainly wrong, and that it is the Russians who are actually gaining ground there. And of course, the Russians, we also read, appear to be gaining ground increasingly in the Kupiansk area as well. And I got reports that yesterday that suggested that the Russians have made some significant progress 
in the advance towards Kukyansk. And I've noticed that some Russian telegram channels, including, by the way, Slavyangrad, are now posting articles, posting discussions about how the fight for Kupiansk might develop, how the uh, battle for control of this town might develop once the Russians get round to assaulting it, which suggests that an assault on Kupiansk might be now approaching, we might be closer to that point than we have been until recently. Incidentally, one of those reports, the one I read on Slavyangrad, actually um, said that Kupiansk will be a difficult town for the Ukrainians to defend because after they recaptured it in the autumn of last year, they failed to take the precautions of establishing fortifications around it. They didn't really expect that the Russians would return to Kupiansk and they assumed that it would remain permanently under their control so that the town is not heavily fortified. There are certain structures within the town that could be converted into fortified positions. But if or when the Russians do launch an assault, the town is basically wide open. Anyway, that's the situation on the front lines from what I've been able to see from the various Russian and Ukrainian channels that I've referenced. Ukraine stuck on the southern front lines, on in Piatikhatki, um, south of Orechov in the Rabotino area. They're making no progress there whatsoever. Um, Ukraine stuck in the Remevka ledge. They pushed the Russians out of Staromayorsk, perhaps, though the Russians occasionally do apparently still deploy troops in the village, though not on a permanent basis. But for the moment, Ukraine seems unable to push beyond Staromayorsk. They failed to reach the front lines in any one of these areas, the real Russian front lines, the big fortified lines, the Surovikin line, in any of these areas. The Bakhmut operation may be ebbing, and there are now reports from the Russians that they are pushing the Ukrainians back in the Bakhmut area. And the Russians are continuing their advance in the north. And as we see, there's now serious discussions in Russian telegram channels to discussing how attacks might be conducted on Kupiansk. Now, there's some reports that the Russians have also gained more ground in the Avdevka area. Avdevka is this town, perhaps more properly a suburb of Donetsk city, which Ukraine still controls. It's the place where Ukraine's um, forces, which have been besieging Donetsk city since the fighting in 2014, are, is, are centered. The Russians launched an offensive towards Avdevka in March of this year. It's been slow progress, but Avdevka is now effectively surrounded by the Russians on three sides, and the pincers around Avdevka have been gradually closing, though they have to do so slowly because of the very strong Ukrainian resistance and because of the extent to which places like Avdevka are now heavily fortified. But a report yesterday suggested that the Russians have gained ground in Avdevka over the last couple of hours and that the pincers in Avdevka are coming closer 
to closing shot. In which case, of course, Ukraine faces the prospect of either leaving its troops encircled in Avdevka, hoping perhaps that a counterattack will be able to relieve them of what would then become a Russian siege, or of pulling them out of Avdevka, perhaps the more practical and realistic option, and retreating from this town, which will make the position in Donetsk city easier. It will reduce the amount of shelling of Donetsk city that um, has been taking place. Short time ago on the Duran, we did a program with Patrick Lancaster, the um, Canadian reporter who regularly visits the front line in the Donbass and provides us with very factual, very clear, very precise reports of the fighting. You can see what he has to say over the course of the video about Avdevka, about its importance, about the shelling of Don Donetsk City from Avdevka and from the Marinka area, and uh, about the progress of the battle there, and about a dangerous incident in which he and his party were tracked by a Ukrainian drone whilst they were in the Avdevka area and the way that they escaped shelling by Ukraine. So you can find all of that. There's a video we did it about a week ago, perhaps a bit longer. You can find it on the Duran and you can see his descriptions of what is going on there. Well, that's my summary of the situation on the battlefronts. Perhaps not very dramatic news, though perhaps we could see major events happening near Kupiansk. But the key thing to say is that Ukraine's offensive is, has been fought to a standstill. Did I say Ukraine's offensive? Well, Oleksiy Danilov, the Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, one of the most powerful figures in Ukraine, has actually said that there is, in fact, no offensive or counteroffensive underway at all. He says that there are various military operations and that he doesn't actually use the expression offensive or counteroffensive to describe them. And, well, <laughs> that's what he said. Now, I'm going to now take a, a look at an article which has appeared in CNN perhaps the most pro-Ukrainian site of all, though I should say less strident in its expressions than some of the British media has been. And one will get a sense of how subdued the mood, even in the West, about the progress of this offensive has become. Anyway, the article, which appeared yesterday, says that Ukraine says density of Russian mines is insane as it plays down counteroffensive expectations. And the article goes on to say a week after US officials said Ukraine was deploying extra two troops to its counteroffensive, movement is limited on the southern front lines with front fighting concentrated in two parts of Zap Zaporozhye region, according to available videos and statements from official sources. And then it says that Ukrainian officials continue to cool expectations for the progress of the operation, while Russian appointed officials claim that Ukrainian attempts to break through Russian military lines have been defeated. Um, and it goes on to say Ukrainian forces have struggled to breach layers of Russian defences as tank traps and minefields slow their advance. The Ukrainian military said one Russian position in the Zaporozhye sector had been eliminated along with an ammunition dump. I'm not aware of what this ref 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 refers to. Perhaps 
it could be a reference to the purported capture of Staromayorsk, though as I said on many occasions, it seems as if Ukraine isn't actually in control of Staromayorsk. But anyway, that's what the Ukrainian military has apparently alleged. And then CNN, however, goes on to say around the Bakhmut area, the Ukrainians have not reported any further progress, but have posted video of the targeting of Russian positions. And then we hear what Sirsky has been saying. And it, they go on to say that Oleg, Alexander Sirsky, commander of Ukrainian land forces, posted on Telegram that a gradual advance continues in the Bakhmut area. And I've previously pointed out in a recent video that um, Sirsky's comments about the fighting in Bakhmut have taken on an increasingly bleak, bleaker tone. A few weeks ago, he talked about how the Ukrainians have Bakhmut, the former Bakhmut, under their fire control. He then, a little while later, said that Ukraine has achieved all the conditions to recapture Bakhmut. More recently, he's talking about what appears to be increasingly gradual progress. And that's what he's, of course, most recent program, most recent comments are saying. Gradual advance continues, but he's not provided any details. And then CNN unusually says that Russian military bloggers have posted video of, the, of Ukrainian infantry vehicles being struck. One of the bloggers, Radovka, Radovka isn't exactly a blogger, it's more like a newspaper, said that the Russian army continues to repel the advances of the Ukrainian military northwest of the city. The fiercest fighting is now taking place near Kleshevka, a village south of Bakhmut that the Ukrainians have been trying to capture for several weeks. And the last point is made by CNN. So no real progress in the Bakhmut area. And CNN is essentially conceding as much. And then CNN goes on to say in the far north, in the Kupiansk direction, the Russian Defense Ministry says that well-hidden tank forces are providing support to infantry, ensuring the advance of Russian troops. But then CNN quickly tells us here, but here too there is no indication that either side is taking and holding meaningful territory. Well, of course, that's debatable about the Russian advance to the north. And as I said before, if the Russians do capture Kupiansk, and they seem to be talking about an assault on Kupiansk being now coming over the horizon, well then that will most certainly be meaningful territory. And it will be very difficult to ignore the fact. Then we have Danilov's comments. And this again, I'm taking it from the CNN article. Alexei Danilov, Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, said on Ukrainian television on Wednesday that there were no deadlines for Ukraine's counteroffensive. No one can set deadlines for us. Secondly, there is no schedule. I have never used the word, the phrase counteroffensive. There's no counteroffensive. There are military operations. They are complex, difficult, and depend on many factors. The main task for us is to save the lives of our people at the front. We have to understand that the enemy has prepared for these events very well with huge numbers of territories mined. On average, there are three, four, five mines per square meter. Imagine how difficult the work is to remove them, to allow our military to move forward. And if earlier there were hopes that this could be done with the help of equipment provided by our partners, today our units are doing a very difficult job on foot 
in many parts of the front line at night. And that's, he went on to say, that the density, the density of the mines is insane. Notice the swipe, <laughs> the Western partners, the mine clearing equipment that they provided has not been up to scratch. And the Ukrainians, therefore, have to advance through these incredibly dense minefields one step at a time at night because there's three, four to five mines per square meter. I'm sure that's an exaggeration, by the way. I mean, I think that would be, that really would be astonishing, though perhaps the minefields are indeed as dense as Danilov is saying. Anyway, the British Defence Ministry yesterday was saying that it was all the fault of the plants, which have apparently been weaponized by Putin, and who are defending the Russian forces by providing them with camouflage through their foliage. Anyway, it was the plants and the Ministry of Defence yesterday. Danilov again is talking about the minefields. Anyway, um, that's, that's from CNN, a Ukrainian offensive that is basically at a total stop, and CNN wants to downplay the significance of the Russian advance in the north, but notice that it is in fact acknowledging the fact that there has been a Russian advance in the north, which might perhaps prepare readers of this article for news over the next few days, weeks, who knows when, that the, when the Russians finally do get round to attacking Kupiansk, if that is indeed what their plan for the moment is. So, it's not just the Russians, it's not just Russian bloggers and telegram channels and Radovka who are telling us that the Ukrainian offensive is at a standstill. CNN is admitting as much as well. And of course, CNN is not talking about the losses Ukraine has suffered over the course of this counteroffensive. But other articles, numerous other articles in the Western media have acknowledged that it is horrendous. And the fact that Danilov now says that he refuses to use the word counteroffensive to define, des describe what is happening, that there are simply military operations, to my mind, tells the whole story. It is, in effect, an admission that Ukraine's counteroffensive is either close to failure or, in Dalilov's own understanding, has already failed, so he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. OK, so that's the situation on the front lines as of today. Now, let me reiterate again Talk of a stalemate, which is now the new accepted line that has been taking, taken in the West, um, is simply not realistic. If there are plans to renew the offensive in the autumn and the winter with light Leopard 1 tanks left over from the middle years of the Cold War and... Um, old Abrams tanks that have been taken out of store and hurriedly refurbished, that isn't realistic either. The reality is that it is the Ukrainians who look like they're being fought to a standstill. This offensive was their last chance. There was an article that I discussed about two weeks ago by a US instructor who has been 
present in Ukraine. He said that this was Ukraine's last chance. This offensive was Ukraine's last chance. They didn't win the war this year. The war would go on for a long time. And reading between the lines, he seemed to recognize that the likelihood is that Ukraine wouldn't be able to win its war at all. There is a massive Russian build-up underway. Dmitry Medvedev, who is the deputy chair of Russia's Security Council, has now said that between the 1st of January and the 1st of August, 231,000 Russian men have taken contracts with <coughs> the Russian military. There is, in other words, <coughs> a huge expansion of the, Russian of the Russian regular military underway. My impression is that these are, these are older men. These are not teenagers who are rushing to take out contracts with the Russian military. Most probably, they're still being told that they need to do their one year of conscription service. These are older men, probably most of them in their 20s, who have um, obviously served in the military before. They've been trained up again. They've been given generous financial benefits. Medvedev describes what they are. And there is a massive Russian build-up. And of course, as I've discussed many times, Russian military industries are working overtime, increasing amounts of munitions, shells, tanks, helicopters, aircraft, tanks, all of those kind of things. And by the way, whilst I'm on that topic, I recently, on the basis of an article in the Financial Times, uh, have been saying that the US has been able to increase production of 155 millimeter artillery shells from 15,000 a month, which was the case before the current conflict in Ukraine started, to 30,000 rounds a month. In other words, that it had doubled shell production. It turns out that is wrong. The actual production of monthly production of 155 millimeter shells in the United States is apparently around 24,000 rounds a month. Perhaps the Financial Times assumed that shell production had doubled, but it has not in fact doubled. It's been increased by something like 50%, but it's only 24,000 as against a Ukrainian usage of shells, apparently Ukraine, over the course of this offensive, has been firing shells at the rate of 8,000 rounds a day. So the United States is producing as many 155 millimeter shells in a month as Ukraine uses in three days of fighting. And this no doubt explains why Ukraine is now increasingly using, again, its, um, the cluster munitions that the United States has supplied to it. And, of course, <clears throat> all of this must be set against the enormous increase in Russian shell production, which has increased, apparently, to figures which, which are between 3.5 million and 6 million a year, depending on source, but perhaps two to 400,000 shells a day, uh, a month. So that gives us some idea of the huge discrepancies. So we're not looking at a stalemate. We're looking at a situation where Ukraine has probably lost its big hope of ending the war this year. And we're starting to see growing concern in the West about the outcome of the war. Before I conclude my discussion about the um, 
military situation in Ukraine. There are two last topics that I'd like to discuss. The first is that, of course, all that I've discussed up to this point, the general military situation on the battlefronts, the Russian advances to Kupiansk, the standstill in the offensive, those kind of things. They're not the topics that are dominating the media headlines today where the fighting in Ukraine is concerned. The big topic that is, that is dominating the media headlines are more, more drone attacks. Ukraine carried out a whole series of attacks with aerial drones on various places on the southern uh, southern sector against Crimea, for example. Apparently, all of these attacks were unsuccessful. And also, and perhaps more significant, in fact, much more significant, was an attack with seaborne drones on the Russian Black Sea port of Novorossiysk. Now, I should say that this attack was carried out once again with these waterborne, these waterborne drones. So these were shipborne drones, these automated drones, they're sort of kind of like long range torpedoes, and they were launched against Novorossiysk. Now, Novorossiysk up to this point is not, has not been a target. It is not a port, a Russian port, located either on the Sea of Azov or in Crimea. It is some distance to the east of those places, in Krasnodar territory. And it is an important Russian port. First of all, as I understand it, it is a major submarine base. This is where Russia's Black Sea uh, fleet submarines are based. And before um, the Russians regained full control of Crimea during the 2014 events, it was where the Russian Black Sea Fleet was, to a great extent, the, the, the surface ships of the Black Sea Fleet were, to a great extent, also positioned. Today, most of the surface sh ships have moved back to the main Crimean port of Sevastopol, which is Russia's biggest naval base on the Black Sea. But, as I said, the submarines, as I understand it, are still based in Novorossiysk. But it's also an, it, it's also an important port for Russian merchant shipping, and in particular for oil exports. So Russian tankers or tankers carrying Russian oil exit Novorossiysk, um, travel through the Dardanelles, deliver Russian oil to various locations around the world where demand for that oil can be found. And it's not entirely clear what was the precise target of this attack, but the Financial Times is speculating that in fact the attack was directed against Russian oil facilities. Anyway, in the event, it seems that none of the drones got through to Novorossiysk itself. The Russian authorities are claiming that the drones were all destroyed by Russian uh, warships um, in the Black Sea in the approaches to Novorossiysk. But Ukraine is claiming, and there is some evidence, that one Russian ship, a landing ship, did um, there was an impact upon it and it did receive some damage and there's some pictures apparently circulating which seem to show that this ship is listing and it seems that perhaps a compartment of the ship was penetrated but it seems that the ship at least as of the time of the making of this video has not actually sunk but anyway this is an attack on Novorossiysk and it's clear that, as I said, it was basically targeting the civilian facilities of this port, even though, as I said, it was two Russian ships, warships, 
one of which perhaps might have received damage. The port itself, the civilian shipping, the merchant shipping, was unaffected. Now, this is a serious escalation, and there's a number of points to make, first of all, about this operation. Firstly, it's a complex operation, and again, it begs the purpose, the question of how was this operation carried out. Now, the Russians have been launching sustained attacks on Ukraine's Black Sea ports, and part of the purpose of these attacks, unquestionably, is to prevent Ukraine from continuing to launch these seaborne drones. But we see that seaborne drones are still operating. The Ukraine is still able to launch these drones. Now, how has it been done? Now, the first thing to say is that I, of course, myself, don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how it is exactly that Ukraine is able to do this. Uh, it may be that the damage to the ports, the Ukrainian ports on the Black Sea, is not quite as extensive as some earlier reports had suggested. Or it may be that these are drones that are still based on some Ukrainian ships or ships that are controlled by Ukraine in the Black Sea, which were left over from, which were left over. And these are, if you like, the last attacks by these kind of drones. Well, that's all possible. But there's a rather more disturbing possibility, which has been suggested to me by one of the COP, one of the members of the Duran community, former military person uh, from the Indian military, as I seem to recall, who has sent me a email about this. And he has suggested, and it seems to me plausible, that the drones, these particular drones, are being transferred to the Black Sea, perhaps along the Danube, to Romania, and that they are being launched either from there or that they're transi transiting through Romania and perhaps that they're being launched from flagged vessels of another country which have left Romanian ports. That's possible. I can't confirm that. But if that is really the case, then that strongly implies that a NATO country is now actively participating in the war by taking these actions, facilitating these Ukrainian attacks on Russian installations in the Black Sea. And if that is the case, and I'm sure the Russians will figure it out very quickly, then that is a very, very serious matter indeed. And it could result in a significant escalation. Now, that begs a number of serious questions. And I do wonder whether perhaps this is being done in order to pressurize the Russians to reverse their decision to pull out of the grain deal. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about this issue of the grain deal and um, about the effect of the grain deal. There's been some very angry statements that the Russians are weaponizing food supplies and that this is going to affect conditions, food supplies in the poorest countries. There's a long piece by the by the EU's foreign ex, uh, foreign relations high representative Josep Borrell in the Guardian, which makes that claim, amongst others. But I did notice that Secretary of State Blinken has been talking about the United States working in some way 
to get Russia to go back into the trade, the grain deal. And the point to understand about the grain deal is that there does seem to be an accumulating pressure in commodity prices, the price of oil and the price of food globally appears to be rising. It is a misconception that the grain that was being exported from Ukraine was going to the poorest countries. Nobody actually is claiming that or is saying that anymore. I noticed, for example, that Josep Borrell, even as he was alleging that the Russian action is starving the poor countries of food, he didn't actually come out and say in that Guardian piece that Ukrainian grain was being shipped to the poor countries. It was being shipped instead to places like China and Turkey and also to the European Union. And of course, a lot of the food that was being shipped to Turkey eventually found its way back into the European Union as well. And on top of all of this, there's been moves in Eastern Europe, in Poland, to restrict the transshipment of Ukrainian food and grain from um, uh, across Eastern Europe by land also. So there's been a general attempt, well, there's a general trend now to choke off Ukrainian food exports. But the point, about, the point is, of course, that Ukrainian food entering the EU, and most of this grain, by the way, is used, as I understand it, for animal feed. The, its effect has been, well, to some extent, of course, to reduce, to lower food prices globally, but specifically to lower food prices in Europe, and perhaps to some extent in the West as well. So, given that the Western states have just come through a inflation crisis, which is only very gradually subsiding, um, and given that there are going to be difficult elections in many countries, including, of course, the United States next year, it is understandable that Western governments might be anxious to see food prices remain low. And though one can overstate the extent to which the cancellation of the grain deal has actually affected food prices, there's some suggestions that the effect has actually been minimal. Um, one can understand why they might want to continue exports of food from Ukraine into the European Union in order to take pressure of prices, to try to push prices down. Anyway, that's one possibility. And the question is, how does the United States, how did the European Union get the Russians to change their mind? Well, they've already sanctioned Russia to an extraordinary degree. Imposing more sanctions isn't going to make any very great difference. And of course, the alternative of offering to relax sanctions, well, that isn't happening either. I noticed that Josip Borrell, again, in that article in The Guardian, made no such suggestion at all. He suggested that, in fact, there's no sanctions at all, EU sanctions at all, on Russian food exports. So, there really isn't an issue there, according to him, which is only partially true. I'm not going to discuss that at length, but I would point out that the UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, and the former Turkish Foreign Minister, Mr. Kavusoglu, and the current Turkish President, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, all seem to take a different view about that from the one that Josep Borrell is taking. So. If they're not going to ease the sanctions, and if they can't 
increase pressure on the Russians through, through sanctions, what do the Western powers do if they really want to force the Russians to increase, to, to go back into the grain deal without making any significant concessions at all? Well, perhaps interfere with Russian merchant shipping in the Black Sea. I mean, that is a possibility that did, I must admit, occur to me. And it could very well be that that was the plan, that is the plan. And of course, taking steps to disrupt Russian shipping of oil might also be part of the plan. Now, I want to stress this is a guess, but it would be, it would explain if this is also what has happened, why NATO might be facilitating these attacks on places like Novorossiysk by facilitating uh, the launching of Ukrainian drones from, say, possibly conceivably the Romanian coast or from ships with third country flags. Now, that's a very, very dangerous game indeed. And one of the points to make here, and it's a point that's been made today by the Financial Times, is that, of course, <laughs> there is a strong argument why the United States and the administration in particular would not welcome um, attacks on Russian oil installations because the administration wants Russia to continue to export oil in order to keep the pressure, to, to keep the downward pressure on oil prices. That was what the cap, the oil price cap that was being talked about on Russian oil exports, that was, that, what, that, that was what that was all about at the start of this year. Allow Russia to export oil, but at a lower than market price. By the way, on that issue, the price cap on Ural's oil has now been exceeded, and it doesn't seem as if Western governments are prepared to do or are able to do anything about it, but never mind. So the Financial Times makes the point that an attack on Novorossiysk, on the oil installations there, would probably not be welcome to the US administration. Well, that's likely true in relation to, let us say, the economic branch, the people who deal with the economic issues within the administration. But of course, those who deal in foreign policy and defense and all that kind of thing, they might take a different view. And besides, it's also possible that within all the various discussions that take place. The calculation is that a few nitpick attacks on Russian oil installations aren't going to affect the oil price very much. And in fact, the attack on Novorossiysk has hardly done, has not done so. But it might alarm the Russians enough to get them to rethink their decision to exit the grain deal. I have to say, I still think it's a dangerous game. Moreover, I don't think it is going to work if that is the plan. And I think that more likely than not, the Russians will maintain their position, that they will not re-enter the grain deal. And moreover, I also think that their most likely reaction is to take steps to secure, to defend Novorossiysk, to make sure that drone attacks on Novorossiysk in future are not successful. So that's what I wanted to say about this incident. It is a serious escalation. Even the Financial Times appears to admit it as much. The fact that there's been some damage to a Russian landing ship is not the most important point about it. The fact that Ukraine is now trying to attack 
Russian civilian con commercial merchant shipping facilities is. And of course, um, if the Russians work out that NATO was di directly involved and was facilitating this operation, that would be a serious matter. Anyway, that's what I get to say about that. There is something else I do briefly want to talk, touch upon, and that is this capture by the Russians of the Swedish FC-90 infantry fighting vehicle. Now, I'm not particularly interested or knowledgeable about the quality of Western military machines, I've been hearing an awful lot about this topic over the last one and a half years. Um, there's been huge amounts out there explaining, you know, the relative strengths and weaknesses of Western tanks and Russian tanks and Russian vehicles and other equipment. But it is a fact that the FC-90 has been described by many people as the most effective, the best so, sorry, I should say the CV-90 as the best and most advanced infantry fighting vehicle in the world, uh, bar none. Anyway, um, the Russians have captured one and they've undertaken an inspection. And um, interestingly enough, it was captured on the northern battlefronts in the area um, under Lieutenant General Mordvichev's command and Mordvichev and his uh, headquarters recently or yesterday hosted a visit from no less a person than the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Now by the way the very fact that Shoigu is meeting this particular headquarters is another reason why I think it is quite likely that there is some sort of plan underway for Mordvichev's troops to push on towards Kupiansk because why otherwise would someone like Shoigu be going there? Perhaps he's gone to learn what Mordvichev's plans are and to find out what kind of weapons and supplies Mordvichev needs in anticipation of the forthcoming attack on Kupiansk. But while Shoigu was there, um, Mordvichev and his, and his team informed Shoigu about their preliminary views following their inspection of the CV-90. And the Russian Ministry of Defence has provided a rather interesting discussion of this topic. And I just read the ministry, the Russian Ministry of Defense's report. The group's commander, that's to say Mordvichev, presented Shoy Sergei Shoigu with one of the many enemy armored vehicles captured in the course of the battle, in particular the Swedish manufactured CV-90 infantry fighting vehicle. The fighting vehicle, which entered service with the Swedish armed forces in 1993, was disabled and abandoned by retreating Ukrainian servicemen after being hit by a shot from an RPG-7 shoulder-launched anti-tank rocket-propelled grenade launcher. I should say the RPG-7 dates from the early 1960s. It is the most widely used anti-tank weapon in the world. Um, there are some highly modernized versions of it but they are extremely common in the Russian army. It's a Soviet weapon, but they're still manufactured in Russia. It's the most widely used um, anti-tank weapon, both in the Russian army and globally. And it is, by most people's acknowledgement, a very effective weapon indeed. Anyway, that's a quick comment about that. Anyway, the report then goes on to say, during the inspection of the trophy equipment, Lieutenant General Mordvichev drew the attention of the Russian Defense Minister to the lack of spare parts, tools and accessories supplied by Western countries, which it makes it impossible to carry out operational repairs 
in the areas of combat operations. Now, that's an interesting statement that the West supplies tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and artillery pieces to Ukraine, but isn't keeping Ukraine fully supplied with the spare parts, tools and accessories to keep these vehicles operating, especially when they've suffered damage and need repair. And by the way, that would not surprise me at all. From a political point of view, it's always easier, tidier, to send complete vehicles, in in complete vehicles, the sort of thing you can show on film, sending vitally necessary things like tools and spare parts that's less photogenic and it's the sort of thing that perhaps gets neglected. So that wouldn't surprise me. But then they discuss the CV-90. Another disadvantage of the Swedish armoured vehicle is its low rate of fire. It is fired with three magazines of eight shells each, after which it requires reloading, which can take up to one minute. In addition, the Swedish manufactured armoured vehicles supplied to Ukraine lack a guided weapon system and have a low survivability due to their silhouette. There you go. And there's pictures, there's photographs, there's actually film of Shoigu inspecting this thing. Well, is that true? Well, I'm not going to say. It's just what the Russians are saying, that apparently they've checked out the CV-90 and they're not that impressed with it. I've heard others say, I'm not going to say which others, that Western equipment tends to be over-engineered and over-complicated and f too fragile to function effectively. On the battlefield, this is apparently especially true of American equipment. And I've also heard that in the case of Swedish equipment, that problem is, if anything, even greater. And I have to say, if that is true, it would not surprise me at all. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about this. And this is where I leave my discussion of the battlefields and of the situation, the state of the conflict in Ukraine for the moment. As I said, stalemate on the battlefields, strong signs that the Russians are now seriously thinking about storming Kupiansk and a rather dangerous or at least a rather concerning attack by Ukraine using seaborne drones on Novorossiysk, which might potentially lead to something much more dangerous. Now, yesterday in my program, I said that I would return to the topic of the Russian economy. And there's been a whole spate of articles about this in the media in the West. Um, and it's been very interesting to see the contrast between the mood in Russia and um, the mood as expressed both in terms of official discussions but also apparently on the street my colleague Al Alex Christoforou is now on a visit to Russia he's visited Moscow he's now in St Petersburg he's got an impression about the economic picture he talks about a strengthening economic picture, a mood of growing optimism, a buzz of activity, all of those things. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the Russian side. They're increasingly optimistic about their view of the economy in Russia and some renewed apocalyptic claims about the state of the Russian economy that are circulating in the West. Now, part of it, I am sure, is related to the fall in the value of the ruble 
against the dollar and the euro. And I think I've already talked about this. I've said this is essentially, indeed, entirely a product of trade flows. It's hardly possible now to sell <laughs> rubles in large amounts and buy dollars. Um, we're not really in a position any longer, even if people want to, to convert all their rubles into dollars and rush for the exits. We're not really talking about capital flight in Russia anymore. That, that really isn't possible anymore. And I think it's also very important to add that if we're talking about um, currency movements in terms of the ruble, the ruble is a very lightly traded currency indeed nowadays. It always has been. I mean, the number of people who buy and sell rubles is, has always been small, even before the present conflict and the sanctions began. And since the sanctions began, it's become smaller still. I suspect that the major foreign currency traders who deal in rubles can probably be counted now in <laughs> probably the fingers of one hand and are probably all known to the Russian authorities who are probably in regular contact with them. And I suspect most of them are based in Moscow anyway. But anyway, it is not a symptom of capital flight or anything of that kind. But as the Russian authorities have undoubtedly rightly pointed out, it is a product of trade flows of a rapidly recovering economy, which we have been seeing throughout the first half of this year. After demand fell in Russia last year, it has grown significantly today. That is sucking in imports as the economy grows and as demand rises, at the very same time that the value of Russian exports has fallen before, because of the widespread declines in energy prices that took place in the, in, in the late winter and the spring and the summer. And in fact, as I've also pointed out, the Russian trade surplus shrank significantly by something like two thirds and Russia's current account, well, it only just remained in surplus by a very narrow margin in the second quarter. And that unsurprisingly has caused the exchange rate, the value of the ruble to fall. Now, what I'm next going to say is controversial and hell will freeze over before the Russian authorities ever admit to this fact. But I'm fairly confident myself that the Russian authorities not only are unfazed about the fall in the value of the ruble, but they have probably engineered it at least to some extent themselves. I said that the number of foreign currency traders who deal in the ruble is extremely small. I suggested that most of them are based in Moscow and that they're in regular contact with the Russian authorities. And I'm sure that the Russian authorities have been telling these people to try to sell rubles, to push rubles a little downwards. And the reason this is the case is precisely the point that I made just before. The decline in the Russian trade surplus and in particular the situation with the current account. By depreciating the ruble, the ruble value of Russian exports rises and the exchange rate strengthens, which in turn strengthens the position of Russia's budget and it enables eventually the budget to, to balance and perhaps, who knows, over the second half of this year to move back into surplus. Now, I previously discussed how after a fairly 
large budget deficit in January of $25 billion. The budget position has improved steadily ever since. And I am reasonably confident that this is due to two factors. Firstly, undoubtedly, an increase in non-oil receipts. This is widely acknowledged, but also probably a quiet, though unadmitted increase in ruble receipts from sa sales of Russian oil, grain and such things from the export companies. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The issue of the pro value of the ruble is one that constantly comes up when people talk about Russia. And once upon a time, it was a very, very big and extremely serious matter. It was very serious matter back in the 1990s, for example, because Russia was at that time overwhelmingly dependent on imports, not just of uh, consumer goods, but also of manufactured goods, and by the way, of food. And it remained a serious issue right up to the time of the 1998 crisis. Since then, the Russian government, uh, the, sorry, the 2008 crisis. Since then, however, the Russian government has worked very hard to reduce Russian vulnerability to ruble movements. And to be frank, I think this is an old issue now. Russia isn't dependent on dollar-denominated or euro-denominated borrowings. Russian banks don't borrow from Western banks anymore in dollars or euros, as they used to do. Um, neither do Russian companies. Russian debt is increasingly not denominated in foreign currencies. Um, and of course, last year, Western governments, the United States government, worked incredibly hard to try to prevent the Russians paying off their debt and to try to engineer an artificial default. Some of you may remember all of that. And of course, all that has quietly died out. I'm not even entirely sure what happened. I gather that the Russians continue to pay for this debt in rubles. And since there's never been an announcement of a formal default, I'm assuming that Russian creditors have been accepting of this and that they've allowed the Russians to accumulate these payments in presumably in ruble accounts in Russian banks and the creditors no doubt they're very unhappy about this but they've no desire to declare Russia in default because they hope that one day when the sanctions are lifted the Russians will simply pay off the debts. And they're not confident that the Russians will do that if a default announcement is ever made. So, anyway, that's the story. So, this isn't as important, anywhere near as important as it used to be. In fact, if you're going to understand what's going on in the Russian economy as a whole, it is irrelevant. But anyway, the decline in the value of the ruble has, of course, led to the predictable claims that Russia is on the brink of some kind of inflation crisis. And there's been some claims that inflation is heading into hyperinflation territory, which is difficult to understand, given that the annualized inflation rate in Russia is around 3.5% at the moment, which is less, significantly less than in Germany or Britain other countries. Um, the central bank, by the way, expects that inflation in Russia overall this year will come out at around 4 to 5% annualised rate, which is slightly more than the 4% target, but obviously not hyperinflationary or anything of that kind.
that's the central bank's calculations. And they've been generally right about these things. And, of course, I've inevitably read some comments by some people that, in fact, inflation is much higher than the Russian authorities are admitting to. And I even read one academic, I've read of one academic who, applying some kind of formula, which I don't pretend to understand, claims that the true rate of inflation in Russia is not 3.5%, but more like 60% on an annualised basis. Now, I should say my friend Alex Christoforou, who is in Russia, is able to confirm that that is simply not the case. I mean, facts speak otherwise. So um, one might come up with some kind of calculation that shows that inflation is or should be at 60%, but that's not what people see who actually live there, not what they experience at all. So lots of claims. Where is all this hyperinflation talk coming from? Well, the reason is that, again, as I discussed at the time, the Russian central bank has been a bit concerned that the Russian economy is overheating, that economic expansion has been extremely fast this year, that demand has been rising on, on the back of um, rising real wages. And, of course, there is a great deal of pent-up demand left over from last year when people in Russia stopped spending, put money away, kept money in their bank accounts because they were worried that following the inflation there would be some kind of a crisis. So there's a lot of pent-up demand. It's been flooding into the economy and it's causing some degree of inflationary pressure. And the Russian government, rather the Russian central bank, responded to that by increasing interest rates by 1%, from 7.5% to 8.5%, to try to cool the situation in the economy down. Now, that is not an indicator of hyperinflation. It is what a central bank is expected to do. It's the sort of thing that central banks in the West have not been doing for a very long time. It is why central banks in the West failed, for example, either to predict or to act to stop the inflation crisis taking hold in 2021, when the Biden administration launched upon a massive spending program right on top of the previous spending that had happened during the pandemic and at a time when the economy was recovering. So the Russian central bank, much more orthodox and conservative than Western central banks, has seen the signs of overheating and does what a central bank is expected to do, which is raise interest rates to cool the economy down and to steady the ship and to keep inflation under control. It is not a sign of hyperinflation or of a pending hyperinflation crisis. It is a sign of a central bank that knows and is doing its job. Now, always, when one discusses this, one comes back to the issue of supply. Because, of course, one of the reasons why some of these commentators are talking about Russia facing problems, hyperinflation problems, is supposedly because there is insufficient supply of goods to satisfy this surging demand. 
Now, the reason for that supposedly is because Western sanctions have restricted the supply of goods on the Russian market. Now, is that actually true? Well, it may be true to some extent. It's probably true that there are some goods in short supply. But again, I ought to say that Alex Christoforo, my friend, colleague, whose views on this I have absolute reliance upon, and other people I know who are in Russia, going round the shops, they see no sign of enormous shortages in goods supplies. And we do know that Russian industries are surging. There was actually an important meeting yesterday in which Putin ha heard a long report from the Russian industry minister, Denis Manturov, and um, the chiefs of various industrial groups were all called in. And this is a typical Putin-style meeting. They had apparently hours of discussion about the issues in the industrial economy. And there are problems there. There's shortages of workers. And no doubt there are shortages of spare parts and those sort of things. I should say that the numbers do, however, point to a major increase in output. And apparently output Industrial production increased by 6.3% in the second quarter, admittedly against the depressed state conditions of last year. But there does seem to be an overall surge. We hear computer and electronic equipment grew by over around 35%, electrical equipment by 30%, rolling stock, machine tools, industrial equipment, all of that kind of thing. Production of all of these is surging. There are problems increasing production of tractors and farm equipment, but discussion over the course of this meeting about how that was to happen. And while I'm on the topic of increases in output in the Russian economy, within the Russian industrial system, it's worth pointing out that Russia has a bumper harvest coming, so, of course, it's very likely that it's hardly, it's, it's very likely that there will be a food surplus in Russia. And that should put downward pressure on food prices, which will, of course, also dampen inflation down. But having said all that, there probably are shortages of spare parts and such things in the Russian economy, not unusual in a situation where there is an industrial surge and for all I know there probably are shortages of certain consumer goods motor vehicles for example a lot of Russia imported a lot of motor vehicles from the west and from Japan cars and such things passenger cars and such things but restrictions have now obviously been restrictions on the export of these vehicles. However, there is an obvious solution to all of this, which is where I come back to that issue of the ruble declining, which is that what you can't immediately produce, you can import. And there is no difficulty for Russia importing finished goods. They're self-sufficient in food, and they can import finished goods, whatever finished goods they need, and they can increasingly also import component parts for their industrial economy. Because they are, at this moment in time, the favoured trading partner of what is by far the biggest manufacturing economy in the world. China accounts for a massive share of world manufacturing. It is the world's manufacturing workshop. Its manufacturing industries are larger than those of Europe, the United States and Japan combined. 
China accounts for a very high proportion, in fact, a disproportionate proportion of the consumer goods and manufactured goods which are consumed in the West. Now, if you have a strong trading relationship with a country like that, then realistically, you are not going to suffer from shortages of finished goods. I mean, to put it as straightforwardly as that, you might potentially run a trade deficit against China, and that's again where all of these movements in the ruble come in. It enables you to keep your trade with China in balance. But the fact is, you can import cars from China, you can import chips, and the Russians do import chips from China in large quantities, even as they're working towards importing higher grade, manufacturing high-end chips themselves. They're not going to run out of consumer goods or manufactured goods or anything like that. Their budget is heading towards balance. The central bank is taking the necessary steps to cool demand by raising interest rates and, by the way, tightening loan conditions. So they're not going to experience hyperinflation this year or next year or the year after or in any year that we can foresee. That is the reality. Now, obviously, there's lots of work to do. There's lots of problems, as I said, in the economy. They still have to replace spare parts used to be made in the West. They can import a lot from China. They can manufacture themselves. They have worries about, as I said, shortages of workers. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about how, given shortages of workers, you might Russia might have to take steps to increase automation. I ought to say that there are always solutions when there are shortages of workers, especially if we're, we are talking about less skilled workers, which I suspect is probably the case, but you can do that by importing labour from overseas, from Central Asia especially, perhaps also from Iran, where a lot of young people, often highly educated and well-trained young people, um, don't have, um, don't have um, jobs, high unemployment places. You can do that. Might not be particularly popular in Russia. There might be political issues around it. You don't have to grant people who come in citizenship. You can have them as guest workers, for example. Do all of those things. Um, as I said, there might be political and other issues related to it. But if it's if you're really worried about labour shortages, you always have the options to do those kind of things. The one thing that I can say with confidence is that a hyperinflationary crisis in Russia simply isn't going to happen. This is a conservatively run country. They're working towards balancing the budget again. <laughs> They're raising interest rates. They're using the ruble to balance their trade position. They're going to take steps to make sure not that the country careers careens into hyperinflation, but on the contrary, that inflation overall, the pressure on prices, continues downward. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say about this. This is a topic that comes up all the time. As I said a few months ago, it was the budget that was going to get out of control. Last year, I remember a Yale professor, I can't remember his name, 
denying that there was any kind of industrial expansion in Russia at all, as all contracting supposedly, and all the statistics that told us otherwise were all smoke and mirrors. Well, that wasn't true then, it isn't true today. This is the latest scare story. I've lived through so many scare stories where the Russian economy is concerned. There's no reason to believe this one. And as I said, that's where we are. So that's me for today. There'll be more from me soon. Let me repeat again, you can find all our programmes on our various channels, or various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. You can... Um, support our work via Patreon and subscribe star links under this video. You can check out our shop. Um, you can look at the uh, our, our, our mugs, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things in our shop. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again. More from me soon. And have a very good day.